Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about remote viewing, also known as ESP, or Psychic Phenomenon. We'll talk about the statistical evidence that proves that remote viewing is scientifically valid. My guest today is Dr. Jessica Utz. Dr. Utz is a professor of statistics at University of California, Irvine. Welcome, Jessica, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you for having me, Dave. I'm excited to be here. Well, I, I know that some of our viewers are already becoming skeptical based on that introduction. <laughs> And so we're going to hopefully deal with that skepticism in just a moment. Mm -hmm. We'll get to the evidence and the statistics. But first, I want to define a few terms so okay. that we can propel the uh, conversation forward. Remote viewing is a term that refers literally to remotely viewing objects or vehicles, buildings, etc., even photographs from a distance. We can't view it with our eyes, but we can mentally visualize it. That's where the ESP type of component or psychic phenomenon comes into play. There are three different categories that we're going to be discussing. One is telepathy, one is clairvoyance, and the other is precognition. So what do those terms actually mean? Well, all right, so let's start with remote viewing, um, just in, in space or time. That mm -hmm. will be important in defining those other three terms. <clears throat> so let's use an example. Suppose your friend has gone to Europe, and you decide one day you're going to tune into where she is. So you do, you tune in, and you get a picture of her in a lake in a rowboat with an island in it. Okay, how did you get that? Well, there's three possibilities that we can think of. One is clairvoyance. It's as if you actually hovered over her and could see where she was. The second is telepathy, which is you read her mind because she knows where she is. And the third is precognition, which means that in the future, she's going to show you a picture of where she was and you're somehow tuning into, tuning into your future where you actually get to see where she was. Okay, so when we talk about remote viewing, a lot of people, the skeptics I mentioned at the beginning here, are going to say, well, that's just a magician trick or some sort of parlor game or lucky guesswork. And, but your statistical analysis proved that it's not lucky guesswork, it's not a parlor game, and it doesn't involve magicians. And I know that uh, there are some limitations, of course, related to remote viewing, but um, you had the opportunity to get involved in statistical analysis and research in this area. Right. How did you get involved in it, and why was the statistical analysis required and desired in that case? Uh, when I got involved, there was a classified program being done at what was then SRI, Interna Stanford Research Institute became SRI International, and I was on sabbatical at Stanford University, and I happened to meet the directors of that program, and they needed statistical help. Now, why statistical help? Well, because any single incident could be explained away as coincidence or a lucky guess, but when you combine evidence, when you do controlled experiments using statistics, you can't explain things away as lucky guesses because we, we control the probability that things should happen just by chance. So they needed statistical help. I was interested, and so we matched up, and I actually went to work for the program for a year, took a leave of absence. And also the CIA was involved in the research right. and other intelligence agencies within the U.S. government. That's right. And they ended up using remote viewing for 15 to 20 years. They did. And so they obviously had enough faith in the efficacy of this or of the validity of this to pursue it. And you were providing the st statistical analysis for that. That's right. During that time, there were two programs going on. There was a very highly classified program where we were using psychics to spy on our enemies. And there was the research program going on, which had a lower secret classification, and that was going on at SRI International. And that was where I was working as a statistician. So we would bring people in and do controlled experiments to see whether or not it would work statistically. And I know that the military was successful, or the CIA was successful, in finding a downed Soviet aircraft in some mm -hmm. remote portion of Africa. Mm -hmm. And our folks wanted to get to that aircraft before the Soviets did, and so we used remote viewing to locate where exactly that aircraft was, That's and right. we did find it. And That's this right. was validated by President Jimmy Carter later on? That's right. President Carter has spoken out on that incident and confirmed that it was true. And there are lots of other examples that have now been declassified of that sort. So yeah, pretty amazing stuff and hard to explain away just by coincidence. 
And there were other examples. There were drawings of gantry cranes where mm -hmm. the Russians were involved in developing strategic weapons or some sort of nuclear technology. That's right. And so we, again, we used that for 15 to 20 years. That's right. And if it was working, why did the government decide to cancel the program in the mid-90s? Uh, in the mid-90s, they decided to have a review done. The Cold War had ended and they were not as interested in those kinds of issues anymore. Um, I think they canceled it. Well, first of all, who knows if they really did cancel it? Um, but allegedly, I think they canceled it because they had so much, many, uh, so much more sophisticated ways of spying on people nowadays. I mean, obviously, if psychic abilities were fantastic and always accurate, we would all know there would be no debate about their reality. So they had more sophisticated spying techniques, and I think they just didn't find it as useful anymore. Well, it's interesting that in the mid-90s, in 1995, you were actually uh, America's top expert in terms of being knowledgeable about the statistical research or stati statistical analysis of remote right. viewing as it was applied to uh, those intelligence agencies. And you were asked to write a paper for Congress to right. review because that's when they were considering whether to fund or defund the program. Yeah. Um, what wa and now we're going to get into the statistical proof. Okay. What was the essence of that paper that you wrote for Congress in 1995, and what were the important conclusions that you came to? Uh, it was actually a team of two of us, and the other guy was a well-known skeptic. <clears throat> so the two of us were asked to look at the scientific evidence, the statistical evidence, and what I did is I looked at the evidence not just from the government laboratories, but other laboratories around the world that were studying the same kind of thing. And what I found was amazing consistency across all of the different um, laboratories that were studying this. And that doesn't happen if it's just a fluke. And so uh, what I found was overwhelming statistical evidence, you know, the 10 to a billion or whatever, against chance um, for the data just by combining the data across the laboratories. The skeptic who was working with me agreed that those, there was overwhelming statistical evidence. He just didn't agree on what was causing it, but he had no alternative explanation. And w when we talk about the statistic, you mentioned uh, one to the tenth billion or something like that. Does yeah. that mean the chances of there being um, a lucky guess would be one out of ten billion or something along those lines? What it means is if uh, people were just guessing, uh, the probability that we would see evidence as strong as we saw, if they were just guessing, was about one in ten billion. All right, and so to put that into some context, uh, you and I discussed earlier that uh, the California lottery was set up in the 1980s. Yeah. At that time, it's, it's harder to win the lottery now than it right. was then, but when they initially developed the lottery, the chances were about one out of 14 million of getting that winning ticket. Um, now, if we just take that number and for easy math, say one out of 10 million, so one out of 10 million is 1,000 times less than one out of 10 billion. Right. So that shows you the odds of winning the lottery are a lot better than coming up with a lucky guess in That's remote right. viewing. And for one individual. I mean, obviously somebody's going to win the lottery, right, but probably for a single individual with a single ticket winning it was about 10, one in, like you said, 14 or 14 billion, a million. Right, one so, out of right. 14 million. That's right, so a thousand times stronger, yeah. Right, exactly. So. Uh, again, back to the validity of this, it, the validity is, uh, through the statistics, is the fact that you can uh, replicate the results right. in testing. And that's right. very important when we're talking about the scientific method is replica replica replicability. I'll we'll never be able to say it, but <laughs> right. that's what it is. Exactly. <laughs> repeatability. Let's use right. that word. So the repeatability on this was in what category would you say? Uh, it was very, very consistent. So at the time, there were maybe eight or ten laboratories who had done similar kinds of experiments, and I found the same size effect across all of them. The bad news is it's not a large effect, but the consistency across laboratories, not to bore people with statistics, but the experiments were set up so that you would get things right by chance about one in four times, and instead consistently across laboratories, people got it right about one in three times. Mm -hmm. So a small effect, but when you add it up or over all those trials and all those laboratories, overwhelmingly uh, against chance. So that means that you have a greater than the statistical odds chance of being correct with, right. with remote viewing. And so we can sort of correlate this with a batting average too, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And so we know that a professional baseball player, is, if he's a really competitive uh, person at the plate, he's going to hit above 300, right. meaning roughly one out of every three times at bat he's going to get on base. Now that doesn't mean that uh, you're going to hit the ball one out of every three times you come up. I mean, there are some days you might strike out four times in a row. 
and the next day maybe hit two home runs. Right. Not so me. I'd strike out not every you, time. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, that's right. the ball player. That's right. And so that uh, if we apply that statistic, we over time, that's mm -hmm. when we come up with the batting average. Is it similar with remote viewing? It is similar in a lot of ways. Nobody can predict when someone's going to hit the ball, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the frustrations. Same thing with remote viewing. We can't predict when someone's going to be able to do it and when they're not, but we do know that they can do better than chance. And mm -hmm. some people can do much better than chance, uh, some of the superstars. Right. Now, one of the most interesting aspects of, of remote viewing is the fact that you can do this over a long distance. Right. In other words, it's just as easy to remote view something in China or Australia as it is in your neighbor's garage down the street. Yeah. I mean, the garage door is closed. You don't know what's in there. Right. But the ability of remote viewing is such that I can do it in China or Australia just as easily as looking in his garage. That's right. And so that means that uh, there's this uh, distance component that uh, is quite amazing and also the precognition that you talked about being able to predict events we used to call that premonition I believe right. and so you have premonitions and you can predict events that aren't going to occur for two mm -hmm. three days maybe right. a week later yep. and so that would seem to suggest that there's some sort of hyper dimensional aspect uh -huh. to remote viewing where time is not just a fourth dimension but maybe there are additional dimensions uh, yeah. We call that, I guess, non-local correlation or non-locality, having that distance ability and that ability to see over time. Um, what does that imply, non-locality? I think it implies that we need to get the physicists working on this. I think there really is something we don't understand about physics and that somehow people are able to go through space and time in the way that we understand it to gain information. I think we have great clues that uh, you can do it over long distances and do it across time. Those are great clues that something is wrong or not, something is incomplete about our understanding of the universe if we think of it as just three dimensions plus time. Mm -hmm. And I know that there is, a, uh, f there is a physicist at UC Berkeley by the name mm -hmm. of Henry Stapp and mm -hmm. he has stated that quantum connections, and that's what we're talking about right. here, uh, could be the most profound discovery in all of science. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I know that the physicists have looked at this in terms of photons, which are particles right. of light, and the smallest particles of light can be generated from the same source and travel in opposite directions and still maintain coherence or connectivity. And that's mm -hmm. the quantum aspect in physics. Right. So we need to pursue this a little bit more in terms of the psychic phenomenon aspect right. as well. Right, so um, physicists understand that that happens in the quantum world. What they don't know is whether or not it happens beyond that in the world of larger things like us, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also probably true that most uh, photons have interacted at some point through the history of the universe, and so who knows if there's some explanation there. It's very puzzling because we don't have an explanation, but those are all clues for where to look, I think. Okay, and on that note, we have to go to the break. Okay. And so when we come back from the break, we're talking about, we'll, we will be talking about additional uh, examples of remote viewing and statistical analysis. What are the limitations and what can it be used for? Stay tuned. How do you present a good image of a Hollywood star that just got arrested last night? That's the job of a public relations firm. Or, as a media specialist, you may suggest new approaches for promoting an idea or product. This degree will prove an invaluable asset for anything it is that you do. You can become a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Dr. Jessica Utz, and we're talking about remote viewing. Now, Jessica, before we went to the break, I said we'd talk about some other um, examples of remote viewing, which uh, are pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. And one of them is the fact that they did tests where they took the remote viewers out into submarines and went 500 miles off the coast and went 500 feet below water in mm -hmm. the submarine, and they still had uh, the same kinds of results from the remote viewers. Right. So when that kind of phenomenon occurs, how do the skeptics manage to explain that away? They don't. <laughs> That's what's interesting. They selectively choose evidence, and I wouldn't call them skeptics. A true skeptic would really be trying to figure this out. I'd call them deniers or debunkers. Um, they selectively pick evidence that is easy to pick apart, you know, like um, some examples where 
somebody in the room knew the right answer. You know, that you can pick that apart because it's too easy to give subtle clues if someone in the room knows the right answer. But having the submarine down there and uh, you can't explain that away. And by the way, one of the reasons they did that was they were trying to rule out like electromagnetic waves as the explanation. So they used various ways to block those kinds of waves. That's why I always laugh when I hear people say, well, if it was real, we should be able to detect waves or something coming out of people's mm -hmm. heads. No, we know it doesn't work that way. Right, and uh, related to what we talked about before the break, if this is some quantum dynamic that mm -hmm. involves multiple dimensions, then the electromagnetic field is not what this is about That's to right. begin with. Yep. And shielding, um, obviously yeah. 500 feet below water and in a submarine is pretty good shielding. That's right. But yes. they've also found that other kinds of shielding using uh, the Faraday cage or something like that, That's right. still do that doesn't make any difference either. Exactly, yep. Okay, and so when we talk about the work that you were involved with, it's very interesting that you were with the Stanford Research Institute with the individuals that set up the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Hal Putoff and, right. and Russell Targ who mm -hmm. put this together, two That's physicists right. who worked with lasers That's right. who were interested in that non-locality aspect of quantum physics that we talked about, yeah. where the photons go in separate directions and yet remain uh, in correlation with one another. Right. So they brought in some of the best psychics uh, of the day. One of them was Pat Price. He mm -hmm. was a policeman from Burbank mm -hmm. who was actually instrumental in locating the getaway vehicle in the Patty Hearst kidnapping back in the That's 70s. Right. You also had Ingo Swan, one of the foremost psychics who was an artist from New York. Right. And then there was Joe McMonagall who was in the military and was a great sketch artist but also had some abilities that were identified and he became a great remote viewer. Now I, I know you worked with Ingo Swan, the artist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and with Joe McMonagall. Right. How did they explain their exceptional abilities and what kind of people were they? Um, they're first of all very interesting creative people. I never met Pat Price and uh, I should also say you know when you said they brought in some of the best psychics they never went with people who claimed to be psychics with very rare exceptions. They wanted people who just were doing other kinds of ordinary things in their lives and able to so somehow use this ability. Uh, Pat Price contacted them saying he had used these abilities in his police work. Um, but Ingo and Joe are both very good artists, but they couldn't be more different otherwise. Ingo really was an artist by profession, and Joe was a military guy, very hard-nosed military guy. And um, one difference is Ingo was really not interested in the science. He cooperated in the experiments, but he wasn't that interested. Joe is very much interested in the science and uh, became a member of the scientific team to see if we could try to figure out how this works. But again, they're both creative. They're both able to sketch things very well, and uh, I think that helps in this. Right, and you mentioned uh, in a previous conversation that Joe was on some type of television program where they would ask him to remote view, and uh -huh. you mentioned that uh, he had a secret. What was that secret? <laughs> that secret was he didn't actually do it in real time. He would do it the night before the TV show, and it would still work. So he would somehow look forward, maybe using precognition, to uh, when they were actually going to select the target during the TV show, and he would sketch it the night before in his hotel room. And that's another amazing example of how precognition works and, uh, and, and with one of the foremost uh, psychics that, that we knew about at the right. time. Um, now, I think we also need to be very careful uh, that we uh, acknowledge that there are a lot of phony psychics yes. out there that are taking advantage of people and charging a lot of money for advice right. that is not really the kind of thing that we're talking about. So should people be skeptical about psychics that are looking for money for advice? Yes, Dave, I'm really glad you raised that point because uh, one thing we know is that this is not a very strong ability or um, you know, it doesn't, you can't be 100% accurate. We've never found anybody who's 100% accurate and that there are various ways to con people uh, just by reading their body language, by seeing if they're wearing a ring. Uh, people come to psychics for three main reasons, you know, career, love, money, and the psychic can easily pick up on that. There are databases now where they can find out a lot about you ahead of time if all they know is your name and your birthday. So yes, buyer beware when it comes to that kind of thing. All right, well, let's talk about uh, psychic ability that uh, people have. Now, in your testing, because you tested a lot of people, right. Do all of us have this capacity? Some obviously have it in much greater quantity than others, right. and I would suggest maybe it's, it's a, a special talent like exceptional musical talent or right. exceptional athletic talent. We already talked about Major League Baseball players, but we could talk about exceptional musicians and artists right. and so on. So do we all have it? Do some have it a lot more than others? Is it trainable? 
And uh, you mentioned, I think, at one point that it's a lot easier to find them, great remote viewers, right. than to train them. That's what did, what did you right. mean by that? It is hard to train people. I think people have, there is a spectrum of ability, I think, just like you mentioned music, that sort of thing, or art. Uh, I think there is a, a spectrum of ability. Everybody can be trained to do it a little bit better by learning to quiet their mind and get rid of the noise or the chatter that's always going on. But beyond that, there just seems to be a natural ability that some people have and others don't, or a spectrum. Um, most of the laboratories outside the government just took volunteers. And those people seem to be able to do it to some extent, not as well as people like Joe McMonagall. But another interesting area of research has been to compare people who believe and people who don't believe that it's possible. And it's called the sheep-goat effect. Studies have shown that people who believe tend to do better than chance, and people that don't believe, not, don't they, they don't just do chance, they do worse than chance. So it's like they're using their psychic abilities to sabotage their results. I think, I find that a really fascinating area of research. But in general, I think it is distributed as an ability, so some have a lot, some have a little. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and so in the event that one is identified as, uh, a, you know, a, um, a talented remote viewer and has some artistic ability. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about Ingo Swan being a, a, an artist from New right. York. He had sketching ability. Joe yep. McMonagall, the other gentleman you talked about who was doing the TV show who came up with the answers the night before, right. or the images the night before, um, he was also a great sketch artist. So. Having that ability to sketch is helpful because mm -hmm. it helps to make the images more clear right. for judging purposes because all of these images are judged to determine whether they're accurate or not. But if someone does have artistic creative, creative ability and also has a, uh, a vivid imagination, is it possible that that imagination and that creativity can actually get in the way of receiving that pure image? Yes, in fact, anytime you have mental noise, um, it gets in the way. So in the experiments we used to do, we had something called analytical overlay. If somebody's getting too analytical, then it's probably wrong. So let's say they're seeing a sharp metal spire and they say, oh, it's the Empire State Building. That's probably wrong. The sharp metal spire is probably right. So the sensations and the just sort of uh, general things that you're getting like that are much better than trying to put it all together and come up with an analytical analysis of what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So if I can draw, that's a step ahead, right. but I have to have the discipline to not let my mind get in the way of what I'm receiving. That's right, exactly. Yep. Okay, and they've done polls of people in 2001, Gallup did a poll of mm -hmm. the general public, and they identified within that polling that more than half of the people polled said they had some experience with psychic phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, college professors and college educated people reported two thirds had had some type mm -hmm. of experience. And so if this is so common, why has it not been um, more accepted in society as a true phenomenon? That's a very good question and I would love to have the answer to that. I think it has been accepted by, like you said, I mean a, a large proportion of people claim to have had experiences and I think even higher proportion claim to believe that it's possible. Uh, and so I think what's gotten in the way are a very, very small group of debunkers who happen to have scientific status. And to me, they're doing a huge disservice to society by making it not acceptable for people to do academic research in this area, because I really think there's something there and we need to figure out what it is. Let's talk about in your own case, when you okay. went to work at Stanford Research Institute and you were going into the research analysis aspect of this, were you skeptical? Did you have some skepticism yourself? And again, we talk about skepticism as being healthy. Mm -hmm. It's not such a bad thing to be skeptical, skeptical about certain things. Right. So how did your thought process evolve over time? Uh, I did have skepticism, and um, I think what convinced me was just the evidence, the accumulating evidence as I worked in this field, and I got to see more and more of the evidence. I visited the laboratories even beyond where I was working to see what they were doing, and I could see that they had really tight controls. They had brought in magicians to see if they could cheat, and closed all the loopholes, uh, and so I got convinced by the good science that I saw being done. And in fact, I will say as a statistician, I've consulted in a lot of different areas of science. The methodology and the controls in these experiments are much tighter than any other area of science where I've worked. When we talk about examples of remote viewing, we've used the examples of the submarine, we've used right. examples of finding uh, the downed aircraft um, in Africa. You've heard, I'm sure, a number of other stories. Right. Um, 
is there a place where people can find out about these amazing stories that are scientifically validated? Uh, there are various places. So uh, Ed May, he's a physicist. He's the person who took over the program after Hal and Russ left it. He's just written a couple of books about the history of this, what was called the Stargate program at the time. So if you look up Edwin May on Amazon, you'll find his books. That's really good. If you just want more anecdotal evidence and really compelling stories, there's a book by a physician named Larry Dossey, D-O-S-S-E-Y, called The Power of Premonitions. And he's got some really compelling stories in there and some of the scientific evidence. So that's what I like about his book is it combines the two. As you've worked with academic colleagues over the years, and we do find skeptics among academics, mm -hmm. um, have you been received with the appropriate level of, of professional acceptance because of this work? Because you know a lot of people do think this work is a little on the edge. Right. Um, or are there still some academics that need to get with the program in this area? There are definitely academics that need to get with the program. But from my own personal experience as a statistician, I have to say uh, the statisticians are a really wonderful, nice community. <laughs> don't tend to backbite each other. Um, so I think the fact that I've just been looking at statistical evidence is better than if I were actually doing experiments uh, and in terms of my colleagues' attitudes. So I think, uh, you know, it's, as a statistician, it's acceptable to look at data. That's what we do. And so I haven't had as much trouble as I would, I think, if I were a psychologist trying to do my own experiments. And I know that you've said that it's time to stop the experiments or the testing to determine whether it's valid or not. That's we've right. been there, we've done that. Yep. We need to go forward with this research. That's and right. uh, you talked about that a little bit earlier in, in this program, but where do you think this research should go and how should it be attacked? I think you're right. The proof is there, and now we have to figure out what's going on. And so we talk about proof-oriented versus process-oriented research. We really need to focus on the process-oriented research. I think what we need is a multidisciplinary team. We need strong funding from some source, and I really think the government should fund it. They're spending billions on medical research. If they were just to spend a couple million on this, I think we could make some progress. But we really need physicists, psychologists, uh, maybe you know, uh, cognitive experts, statisticians to come together and try to see if we can figure out, you know, put out some theories and then try testing them and see if we can figure out what's going on. Whatever it is, I think it's going to revolutionize the world in various ways because there's something there that we don't understand. And it could really change all kinds of things in the world. And why shouldn't we pursue an area of human potential that's out there for right. us to look into? Right, right. Well, I want to thank you for being here today. This has been a fascinating interview. Thank you. It's been fun. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.